Hello, my name is Milena Leibert and I'm a part of the Strategizing Activities and Practices social media team. And I'm very happy to welcome you to this webinar with the title Digital Strategizing and SAP Research. The uh, webinar is hosted by the SAP Interest Group and part of a SAP webinar series where we try to create a space for learning about SAP research for both SAP newbies as well as more advanced scholars. And usually we only have one guest uh, speaker giving a small lecture on a SAP topic that he or she is experienced in. But uh, today it's a, yeah, a little bit more special and we have uh, three guests who, um, who are shown here on this slide. So a warm welcome to Katrina. Um, Richard, Rebecca Whiting and Matthias Wenzel. Very nice to have you here and to have the possibility to hear you talking about digital strategizing and how we can approach it methodologically. Uh, for those of you who don't know our three guests, I will uh, say a few words on their backgrounds and the research interests when telling you a bit more on the agenda. Um, so, that's um, the, the agenda for today. And we will start with two impulse presentations that will both take around 20 minutes. So Matthias will start with his input on the phenomenon of uh, digital strategy making, including some basic information on SAP uh, research. Um, Matthias is a professor of organization studies at the Un Leuphana University of Lüneburg and he usually conducts qualitative studies to investigate phenomena of strategizing through a practice lens and he is experienced uh, for example in qualitative methods such as video analysis as a potential approach for doing research on digital strategy making. The second presentation will be held by Rebecca Whiting. Uh, Rebecca and Katrina are a, a team today, and uh, this part of uh, their team contribution is uh, held, held by Rebecca. Um, Rebecca is a senior lecturer at the Department of Organizational Psychology at the Burbeck University of London, and her research interests cover the fields of diversity, identity, invisible work, and digital technologies, and she's experienced in qualitative methodologies. Katrina and uh, Rebecca recently published a book with the title Collecting Qualitative Data Using Digital Methods, and that's why we decided to invite them for this uh, webinar. Um, so building upon Matthias' presentation, uh, Rebecca will talk about digital methods and qualitative research, and she will talk um, or discuss or maybe a potential fit to approach the phenomenon of, of digital strategy making. Um, let's, let's see. Uh, after having heard these two presentations, we will have a 10 to 15 minutes round where Katrina and Matthias go into a dialogue um, responding to, to, to each other's presentations and, and maybe also talk about some current challenges of qualitative research um, at the moment. Katrina uh, is a professor in the business management department of the School of Management at Swansea University and her research interest, interests cover topics such as identity, diversity, leadership, and digital media uh, devices at work. And like Rebecca, she's particularly interested in qualitative methodological approaches, including digital and visual met methods. Uh, in the last part of, of this session, we open the floor to you as an audience of this dialogue. And um, in case there are any questions coming up during the next 40 minutes, it would be very good if you could note them down and ask them at the end of, of this session in, in point five. And uh, lastly, I would ask you to, to please mute yourself and turn off your videos until we reached point 
Right. All right. Um, so, Matthias, I think I've uh, said enough. Um, the stage is yours and uh, I stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this very warm, warm introduction. I'm, I'm very pleased and very happy to be here today and share a few thoughts on uh, what I would call digital strategy making in that context. Um, you, you framed it as, as di digital strategizing. Uh, Milena, I would call it digital strategy making. That's just a just a minor issue, but most likely we will, we will also have to clarify what we really mean by that. And um, I'm not sure whether I will provide final answers to those types of questions, but um, the, the key conundrum of, of this short, let's say, impulse uh, presentation is to clarify um, why I think um, SAP research, strategizing activities and practices or strategy as practice research would be uh, well situated in streams of research that would cover digital aspects of strategy making um, in greater depth. So let me start out by, by making an important point here. Um, obviously I'm giving a, a short presentation here, but at the same time, I would like to clarify that um, this is not my own and unique thought uh, that I'm presenting here because I'm part of a network called Digital Strategizing with uh, wonderful people. And I'm pretty sure that you recognize some of these faces. And uh, part of what I'm sharing here now is uh, actually something that emerged in uh, conversations with these people. So I, I wouldn't um, credit all these things to myself, but I would um, greatly um, suggest um, visiting the website digitalstrategizing.org if you want to know more about the activities of the network and uh, what, what these wonderful people are all doing. So this is just a brief introduction to that side here. But as I said, the, the main point that I would like to make here is uh, this, uh, that digital strategy making is both an exciting thematic opportunity and at the same time an intricate methodological challenge for extending the SAP agenda. And, Normally, obviously, you know, in, in order to make those types of uh, presentations very appealing, you would usually start out with uh, wonderfully uh, crafted digital initiatives that that draw your attention and so on. I think that this would be one one way of doing it. But the other way of doing it, in order to clarify this point, is to start out with uh, what SAP research is really about, and um, especially for perhaps some of the newbies to SAP research, this might be something quite useful to do, which is why I'm doing it here. So let's start with SAP's conundrum. And um, for clarifying that one, I just brought a quote here uh, by the special issue introduction or from the special issue introduction by Jerzykowski, Balogun and Seidel. And they state, strategy is not something that an organization has, but it's something that its members do. Therefore, Johnson and I'll also speak of strategizing as the doing of strategy uh, and as they then clarify and call for strategy to be refocused explicitly on human activity. So strategy is something that people do and strategy making or strategizing as the doing of strategy. So this brings uh, our attention to practices as the unit of analysis, practices kind of as a nexus, nexus of sayings and doings. And um, well, they explicitly draw our attention to human activity as uh, what we should focus on in order to understand what strategy making in organizations is all about. Um, obviously, this also has some methodological implications that um, that we have to have to consider. But especially in the context of um, of um, excellent research and, and strategizing activities and practices, what we see is uh, quite a breadth of practice-based examinations of strategy making, especially as a human activity. So we have seen um, research on, um, let's say, strategy meeting, you know, the meeting practice is actually age old, but obviously it has been uh, performed in, in, in strategy making quite extensively. So strategy meeting, meetings as one, and strategy workshops perhaps as another, is another uh, very prominent, prominent example in which strategy is made by humans more of obviously, then there are uh, very uh, eye-opening examinations of day-to-day -day strategy work by uh, Jaszczakowski, Berkinski, for example, but also by others. 
And what, what we see here that is that ethnographic fieldwork, especially in methodological terms, seems to be the main, if not uh, the most prominent, but obviously not the only uh, approach for examining strategic practices. So especially in ethnographic fieldwork, uh, you know, with face-to-face -face activity, uh, in-person, on-site, seems to be quite prevalent in, in those types of um, examinations. And, you know, what I would call a manifestation of perfection is what <laughs> Jasiukowski, Bednarek, and uh, Gabon too have uh, called a global team-based ethnography, in which, which they conducted in the global reinsurance uh, trading market. And obviously that's, that's a uh, uh, very well performed eth uh, ethnographic field work, uh, which has generated uh, very insightful journal articles, a very, uh, very inspiring book. So if you have any chance to read any of that work, I would uh, warmly recommend these, um, these types of ethnographic studies here in that context. So really well conducted. But what we now see is, um, now we come to, to, to the digital part of, of these issues. Uh, the increasing use of digital technology in the, in the strategy process. And this perhaps draws our attention to what might be called digital strategy making. And by digital strategy making, I refer to a set of strategic practices um, that are more or less mediated by digital technology. So um, it's not just human activity involved here. And obviously human activity involves not only uh, talk, but also the body and certain material objects. But then we have also have uh, digital technology with, uh, with its own affordances perhaps that um, changes some of those practices that, that are performed in the strategy process. Or we see that new types of strategic practices might, uh, might come into play. And perhaps now we can, can see some, some examples of how this, uh, how this is performed in practice. And I would uh, draw, draw our attention to two extreme cases, let's say, uh, in which um, digital strategy making may or may not actually in the future uh, become very prevalent. And one is what, what I would call algorithmic decision making in the strategy process. Um, one of the um, uh, very active members of our SAP community, Bern Glazer, has published a paper on um, design performances and it's actually uh, embedded in research on uh, routine dynamics. But the paper at its core is actually about um, yeah, strategy making and in that sense, algorithmic decision making in the strategy process. So it's a paper about um, the change the, the, or the change in core activities of a um, law enforcement agency. So um, obviously the core activities then are patrolling and um, that law enforcement agency introduced a game theoretic algorithm to, um, to optimize, to, to, to change those types of uh, patrolling activities. So it's not just, not just human judgment anymore that was supposed to um, yeah, make, let's say, decisions on uh, where to patrol. Obviously, you have to randomize that somehow in order to, uh, in order to, um, uh, yeah, to, to confuse the criminals. In that sense, it's supposed to be an algorithm that, that does exactly that. And it's kind of, a, it's a story about infusing what, what they called intelligence into uh, the day-to-day -day practice of patrolling. So they called it intelligence, not artificial intelligence really, but intelligence. So it, it's, it's an algorithm that is not necessarily self-learning and uh, not necessarily, doesn't uh, fully make its own decisions. Obviously human, human beings can, can still deviate from, uh, from the uh, judgment made by the algorithm. And this is basically what then the paper is all about. Uh, so at its core, it's also ethnographic field work, right? So a lot of this, um, this, um, this paper actually builds on uh, participant observation and, and the typical means by which day-to-day uh, -day performances are captured. But let's, let's just think one step further. Um, as I said, this is uh, a story about intelligence, not artificial intelligence, but uh, the editors of AMJ at least uh, predict some form of um, more intelligent intelligence in strategy making, namely some type of, let's say, self-learning algorithms, uh, machine learning, and all these things that are supposed to help managers uh, make use of big data. And obviously, the, the, the key aim of, of such attempts are to overcome the, the cognitive limits of managers and improve decision making by uh, some types of algorithms that um, supposedly make 
optimal decisions in the face of uncertain and um, unpredictable situations. Now, in that sense, if um, algorithms are supposed to make the st strategic decisions here, it's not really a human activity any anymore that it is at its core. It would be, it would be an algorithm, a self-learning algorithm, some type of machine learning um, that uh, constantly evolves. Then the question is how to study that such, such types of decision-making, right? Um, one approach, as, as we, at least in the technical sciences, is called explainable AI, right? And it, this is basically an attempt to um, gain an understanding of and provide an understanding of how um, artificial intelligence and machine learning um, uh, develop certain patterns over time, right? So perhaps we can, we can learn from the technical sciences, but the problem is that um, there is a paradox in explainable AI. I mean, these, um, on the one side, these types of uh, machine learning algorithms and so on are used in order to overcome the cognitive limitations of human beings. And at the same time, it's the human beings who try to decode these types of patterns. So um, at least um, there, will, there will always be some type of, let's say, um, creative leap within within these algorithms that that uh, human beings and then in that sense researchers will not really be able to uh, to decode and to reconstruct and obviously that provides provides us with a couple of open questions concerning the the methodological uh, implications for such types of strategic decision making um, so you know I, I, to be honest I haven't really seen um, um, those types of strategic decision making in practice yet um, at least the AMJ co-editors uh, seem to envision such types of decision making we'll see how that goes uh, all I'm saying here I think there are there are some some serious methodological implications to consider given that human beings are not the center of uh, strategic decision making anymore in that context and that those types of algorithms might be difficult, if not impossible to understand by human beings, uh, at least to the fullest extent. So now let's perhaps come to some, uh, some, some other example that is, that is already rather hands-on and um, that has already existed before, uh, before the, um, the, the pandemic uh, crisis in that context, namely uh, open strategy. Open strategy as, as a bundle of practices that um, render strategy making more transparent and inclusive. And in that sense, open strategy has to a great extent been fostered by digital technology. So what we, what we know from prior literature is that uh, organizations have used wikis such as Wiki, uh, Wikipedia in their strategy process. Um, there have been startups using blogs to, to blog transparently about their strategy. And uh, in that sense also in, involve other stakeholders in, in those types of decision processes, which is uh, quite remarkable against, against the background of strategy making as something um, to, be, to be hidden from competitors, let's say, in order to create a competitive advantage. And then we also see um, the involvement of stakeholders through platforms. So for example, for example, Neely and Leonardi have uh, uh, published a paper on using social media for uh, knowledge strategies, sharing knowledge with employees, for example, and in that sense, um, broadening the, the, the own knowledge base in order to, um, to share stuff uh, with other stakeholders and uh, grow jointly and together. So there are, there are different, um, let's say, uh, digitally backed uh, ways of, of conducting open strategy and, and they have already been out there for quite some time. And perhaps we don't have actually have to have to go very far in order to find these types of open strategy processes. Here's, another, here's actually a rather recent attempt to conduct open strategy. And um, this is, um, if, I mean, if you look at uh, the Zoom picture, obviously you, you recognize that the, the, the left-hand picture is, uh, is a screenshot from Zoom. And perhaps you recognize some of these faces because they're all members of the SAP community. And um, these members of the SAP community engaged in a, uh, in a strategy workshop. Say, so they basically reflected on potential strategic directions of the SAP community. And by the way, this is part of a larger uh, project in which, in which uh, all SAP members will also be involved and uh, uh, will have, have a possibility to participate in this process. So, 
please watch out for, uh, for any announcements coming up in this regard. Um, but what we see here is, is a combination of, of two uh, technological tools or two, two digital tools that we used. On the one side, we have, we have Zoom, obviously, some video conferencing technology. Um, on the other side, we used Miro, which is a board um, that, that is basically kind of a collaborative uh, tool for brainstorming, for developing ideas and so on. So you, there are very different purposes for using that technology. And we basically use it as a, we could say, as a digital flip chart uh, that, that you usually find in strategy workshops in which you simply put on post-it notes, like digital post-it notes that say, we had a scale where you could put your dot uh, on a level of attractiveness, attractiveness of the different options and so on. So um, basically uh, very simple tools one could say, but if we look at how we, uh, uh, perform strategy making, the, the practice itself was very different. In, in principle, we actually uh, uh, were much more, let's say, collaborative and, and participatory than any, uh, let's say, analog strategy workshop would ever be. Because if you, if you have a flip chart in the, in, the, in the strategy workshop, there's always that one person staying in front of the flip chart and having the flip chart marker uh, and uh, noting down some opt or, or some some comments and and that person doesn't material materialize other options right so there's always this this kind of asymmetry involved between actors in the strategy process and here in, on the Myra board everyone was able to uh, post stuff on on that Myra board at any time and they, everyone could see what others were doing and so on so in that sense um, it, I think it was was a was a uh, an interesting manifestation of open strategy by means of, of digital technology. Um, and as I said, more coming up here. So overall, if we look at um, what, what these um, opportunities provide us with, there, there I think are, are important questions to ask, especially against the background of strategizing activities and practices. Um, and I, I think that our community is uh, much better uh, situated in addressing those types of questions than others because they, they do involve um, the, the subtle day-to-day -day, uh, stuff that, that others wouldn't really, wouldn't really identify with, with their lenses and with their uh, paradigms and so on. So, you know, question number one, for example, could be how does the translation of analog strategic practices into the digital sphere transform these practices. And I just mentioned one example. I mean, we, we kind of literally, literally translated some standard workshop practices into a digital one, and it did transform the way we, uh, we uh, perform strategy making. The second, I think that's also one that, that some participants might reflect about. How does the strategy making in the virtual sphere relate to participants' part substantive day-to-day -day work? Now, obviously I used uh, quotation marks here as a Kind of fleeting quotation mark to uh, re refer to the yeah more or less metaphorical use of these terms. Obviously, strategy making can be very substantive, and day-to-day um, -day work doesn't necessarily have to be. But what we see is that some some of that virtual stuff might not necessarily translate into what people do later on. Um, other th other things such as creating a joint understanding might be quite interesting, but also the use of uh, you know the subtle uh, differences between people and as they uh, perform the technological skills might be might be relevant, um, and many other questions that you that you can think about in that context. Um, but this is just a you know loose list anyway. Um, so so I think I don't have to go into detail of any of the, of these of these questions. I think another important issue that we that we should think about is the the methodolo methodological question, the methodolo methodological side of uh, of all these types of questions. And um, I would argue that that digital strategy making does impose some methodological challenges that we have to think about uh, more carefully. Um, I'm I'm pretty sure that you might have come across the the picture on the left hand side uh, as it. As it was, uh, as it kind of went viral rather recently uh, in the context of uh, balancing work and life uh, while working remotely at home, right? And that was a CNN expert performing a you know an expert interview on CNN, and as we see on the you know on the right hand side of that picture, um, the surroundings looked quite. Uh, 
quite the opposite to what was really seen in in that in that uh, Zoom picture. You know that was was a very different context in which that um, picture went viral. But but the point is that we do not really see um, behind these uh, these you know Zoom Zoom uh, tiles what people are really doing or how people are really making strategy. So there's still a certain distance involved that creates a bit of uh, methodological uncertainty to, to with regard to the extent to which we really capture what uh, people do on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, if you look at, at the right-hand picture, um, it might just symbolize that people might do very, di very different things while they may look very attentive to what, what the strategy workshop, let's say, is doing in that very uh, specific moment. So, um, especially against the background of SAP is looking at what people do on a day-to-day -day basis, this is my timer, so I think I'm, I'm pretty much good on time here. Um, what, what people really do in strategy making, especially in, in the digital sphere, might be something that is very, very difficult um, to capture empirically. And this is obviously one of those open questions that um, I would like to hand over to, to Rebecca and Katrina. And let's, I, I really hope that they have some very interesting answers that they might provide us with with regard to that question. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Matthias. Sorry, I was muted. Perfect. Um, I think, uh, yeah, we can directly um, hand over to, to Rebecca. So Rebecca, you, you can start if you want. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Can everybody see that screen? I'm just trying to put it into slideshow. Yep. Thank you, Melina. And thank you very much for the invitation to, to take part in this evening's webinar. And thank you, Matthias, for the, for the suggestion. Um, this, this presentation is uh, a, a sort of an attempt to encapsulate what, what essentially is a book. Um, and a book that came out of a, a project, nothing to do with strategizing, but actually a project on age at work uh, that Katrina and I started back in 2011, I think. So 10 years ago. So it's amazing. Yes. Um, and we've obviously blended our identities along the way somewhere. Um, so this, uh, this methodology that we're talking about tonight um, is a methodology that, that was conceived in a very particular context, but we quite soon realized it had a uh, sort of potential for a sort of wider application. Um, so I hope that over the course of the next 20 minutes, um, people can think about how it might be applied in, in the particular context uh, that the, uh, the staff interest group might be uh, interested in. So I'm gonna introduce um, tracking and trawling, which is the names that we gave to, to our particular methodology. Um, highlight some of the kind of key steps. I'm going to take a little time just to talk about ethics because actually that's quite pertinent uh, in a kind of online context and then uh, just finish up kind of looking a little bit to the future and highlight a few additional resources that might be useful. So starting kind of at the beginning, um, why an online qualitative data approach? Um, Katrina and I both work in sort of organization studies field um, and and we could see even 10 years ago, you know, the extent to which the web was kind of permeating and even replacing uh, traditional forms of organizing. And we've also um, paid attention to the fact that organizing doesn't necessarily occur just within organizations. So um, I and I think um, as Matthias has just outlined, you know, strategizing also incorporates digital work. So there's there's a kind of wider context here about the move to activities taking place online, which we were really keen to, to capture. And of course, particularly 10 years ago, um, most of the work was happening in the field of kind of big data. And uh, I think our view was that uh, qualitative research had a contribution to play. Um, we didn't think that big data was necessarily better data. Um, and we felt that if big data was sort of mapping and mining the web, 
then with our methodologies, we might be able to examine how we navigate the maps and uh, negotiate the, the mines. So it's not, uh, we haven't really positioned ourselves in competition with, with big data approaches, simply a recognition um, that by embracing a qualitative approach, you expand the range of research questions that it's possible to answer. And quite frankly, with the internet being described as the most comprehensive electronic archive of written material representing our world and people's opinions, concerns and desires, why would qualitative research not want to have a part of that action? So, so that was kind of um, uh, our, our sort of philosophical starting point here. And what we developed, as I said, were these two methods of collecting qualitative online data. And we called them, after some deliberation, tracking and trawling. And you'll note the kind of natural world metaphors that we drew on in, in naming these two methods with, um, with sort of, to set the scene, because this was a funded project, we needed a systematic way of collecting online qualitative data and thinking ahead to writing up for publication. We knew that it had to be, it had to have a degree of transparency and uh, it needed to be systematic. So with that in mind, as I said, we, we thought in, in these kind of natural world metaphor ways about tracking as essentially um, a, a kind of sense of following uh, a target that was moving forwards across the internet in new and unpredictable directions. Um, so it was kind of perspective. So it involves using a variety of digital means, um, including proprietary tools. We use Google Alerts, Nexus, and I think Tweelerts to track a particular event or a group of people or a concept of interest uh, and their engagement with a particular topic that's relevant to the research. So you start at the beginning of the project and you track forward new material as it's published on the internet. Trawling uh, kind of to us invoke the sense of, of going back and finding material that was already there. So this is where you might use search words in search engines to provide information that's already been posted on the web in the form of maybe websites, blogs, Twitter, whatever. So it's a retrospective trawling of the internet for existing material that's already been published or posted before you've started uh, the research uh, project. Um, and they can, of course, be combined. So we're not studying specifically how people use the internet. And it is, I think, distinct to ethnography or online ethnography or netnography, where there's probably a greater immersion on the part of the researcher. Um, whereas for this kind of uh, methods, the researcher is a little bit outside uh, the data, although because Katrina and I were both blogging about it, we did occasionally find our own blog posts popped up in our alerts that we uh, set up as part of the, the forwards tracking. Uh, so, so we weren't entirely outside our data set. And there are some common features, although we conceived of these as, as kind of separate methods, we did come to see them as being kind of either end of a spectrum. Both of them require the researcher to develop key search terms, whether you're retrospectively or prospectively setting up uh, kind of uh, searches and alerts. Both can be used with different proprietary tools. Uh, both can be combined with other methods of data collection. So they, they work quite well in combination, you know, with interviews or, or other forms of data collection. Um, and it, they're infinitely flexible in terms of being able to use them to carry out multiple search terms, uh, whether it's a construct, a concept, an individual, a group, or some sort of uh, organization. Um, you know, you can set up multiple ones. And we piloted our search terms for efficacy before we kind of launched full on. And we would certainly recommend doing so to get a sense of whether your searches are picking up the material that you would hope to get and expect. Um, and then once you receive your alerts coming in, and we would certainly recommend setting up a dedicated uh, email address for, for those kind of tracking alerts, um, you have to 
sort of sift through for relevance. Um, it isn't that a data set it magically appears. There's a lot of synthesis and uh, discarding of irrelevant material and uh, assessing of relevance at that point. But it's flexible because it allows you to capture different forms of internet data, um, but also the need to be reflexive because obviously what you get, um, those results are going to be determined by the algorithms of the different proprietary tools and platforms. So you need to be aware of that and to kind of factor that in as part of the sort of reflexive methodological process. Um, they are adaptable. Uh, obviously with trawling, you can always keep going back and expanding the search. Um, but for tracking, although you can't um, retrospectively sort of track forward, you can add as you go along new search terms. Um, and each, as I said, can be used to kind of supplement uh, the other. So these are, I'm sure, entirely predictable and familiar to all of you uh, steps in a kind of average qualitative research project. Um, and our methodology is no different in that sense. So, so you still have to go through all of these uh, steps and issues. And as I said, I would absolutely recommend uh, the use of um, a pilot study to test the efficacy of search terms um, and also having a really transparent process of uh, sort of sampling and selection uh, in terms of, um, you know, making sure that you have a really clear strategy around what is and isn't going to be within the scope of your, your data set. And again, because we were doing a project and there were two of us working on it, uh, we had a sort of protocol that we developed that, that meant that each of us could, could undertake that, that sort of uh, assessment. Um, but we, we needed that and we needed a pretty good system of data management as well. So, what I particularly wanted to focus on uh, tonight, however, is the aspect of research ethics, because this this 10 years ago felt a bit like the Wild West in that it, it felt quite unregulated in many ways. So we went back to kind of core ethical principles. And of course, they are exactly the same for Internet research as they would be um, in any other project. The um, the issue was that they were much more, much less well developed in terms of what they meant in this context. So the idea of minimizing risk of actual or potential harm to participants and researchers, um, ensuring the maximum benefit of the research, uh, making sure that the research could be justified, and the principle of informed consent. But what does that mean in the internet, internet context? Um, I guess for all of us, we have a particular disciplinary standing and I'm in the Department of Organisational Psychology. So the British Psychological Society's UK guidelines um, were relevant uh, for, for my consideration. So different disciplines will potentially have um, guidance that you, you need to adopt. And the BPS certainly has specialist guidelines around internet research. Um, at an institutional level, obviously you've got your own processes and guidance we were very much kind of um, a sort of pioneering within uh, Birkbeck, which is where we, we sought the initial um, ethics clearance. Um, so, so that did lead to some interesting discussions. Um, and then there's uh, bodies like the Association of Internet Researchers who also have their own uh, guidance. So there are lots of um, areas where you can go for sort of information about this. What Katrina and I distilled after some years of, of sort of working on this was that there were kind of four, for us, four key debates. And one was that the internet is not a single unitary location. There are places on it uh, which I think can be safely regarded as public, um, but there are also spaces and places on it where the users of those places, even though they may be accessible by members of the public, are not regarded as a public space and the local practice and usage of those spaces um, suggests that they are regarded by their users as private. Um, so custom and usage of particular locations. And I'm thinking here sometimes about forums that have been set up, um, 
the, the, the research, the empirical research that's being carried out about people's um, sort of, uh, or about asking people who use those spaces about what they think about researchers taking material from them and using it as data is that they would regard that as, as a, a kind of breach of privacy. So, so all, all spaces are not equal here. Um, the really knotty is, issue is, are you dealing with human participants? Um, and that's quite a kind of key issue here. Uh, we and our own institution didn't entirely see eye to eye about this. Um, but over time, I think we have come to, to see that this is again, quite a nuanced um, assessment that has to be made uh, in the context of the specific location that you are collecting data from on the internet. And um, there are some helpful um, sort of decisions uh, that you can work through to assess whether or not um, human participants are involved, which look at things like the, um, the degree of entanglement between someone's personal and private persona on the web, um, the degree of interaction that you have with the data as a researcher and the kind of privacy expectations, the degree of sensitivity of the topic, um, all of those can have a bearing on, on the decision you make there. And obviously if you decide that you are dealing with data which involves human participants, um, then you need to be seeking informed consent. Um, but that may sometimes be for, uh, from a forum owner rather than individual users. Um, and the fourth issue was around anonymizing or attributing. Um, so if people have published material on the web, um, there is, and, and of course, Twitter uh, sort of almost requires this, uh, that you publish the identifying uh, sort of author information and attribute. Um, but again, that has to be seen in that bigger ethical context of, um, you know, not exposing people to more harm than their original act uh, would have given rise to. So that is a bit of a whistle-stop tour of that, but it, it is quite a, a key element, I think, of, of this process. Um, so looking more broadly here at um, the kind of core elements of uh, tracking and trawling, as I've said, it is a flexible approach. Um, it enables you to work within different paradigmatic stances. Uh, so it's flexible, it can be uh, adapted to different epistemologies, but that does require then a kind of genuine and ongoing engagement with the uh, ontological and epistemological framing of your uh, research. It's very adaptable, so it enables you to work with a range of online and digital resources but then um, it requires an understanding of the way in which these resources and the means of accessing them um, shape our understandings. And it's very timely. I mean, to be fair, Katrina and I didn't expect it to be quite as timely as it's turned out to be with the, with the pandemic. Um, but in terms of its engagement with time, because of the prospective and the retrospective aspects of tracking and trawling, it enables you to look both forward and back to things that are going on on the internet and therefore requires quite a careful consideration of the sort of temporal framing um, of research objects and subjects and encourages us to reflect on time, you know, within our research practice. So just finishing up here, um, in terms of where, where next? Well, yes, <laughs> that, that is the big question at the moment, isn't it? Um, at the moment, the future is looking very socially distanced. So research very possibly will be too. And this method does have that huge advantage that it, as I said, requires very little in the way of face-to-face -face interaction with anyone else. Um, so it's quite a practical method. Um, the, the quote here from Baptista about organizations in the world of work having been you know, pushed uh, further towards digital forms of organizing in response to COVID uh, related restrictions. Well, it, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? 12 months ago, we might not have foreseen exactly how much of our lives and our work was going to be online. Um, and I think that does invite us to think about new combinations of digital and traditional methods. Um, and so data is evolving too. The big challenge here is the very ephemeral and transitory nature of data that appears on the internet. 
um, which certainly highlights the practical necessity of having a good data management system uh, if you undertake uh, the kind of work that we've we've outlined um, so that you actually have a record of it. There's nothing more frustrating than to find your data has disappeared. Um, multimodality is the new norm, hence um, our interest in visual as well as textual data um, with a whole set of new uh, challenges around how, how we might analyze um, text and visual and the two together, uh, because it, multimodality is such an integral part of, of the um, online data. And of course, uh, new challenges uh, around authenticity and deep fake. Um, so we, I think, are still working our way through. But I would just say that, that the relevance of that will partly depend on your epistemological stance and your research questions. So um, I've put up here in the slides, and we're happy to share the slides, some further resources. Um, and uh, yes, that's it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Rebecca. And uh, yeah, I think yeah, you, you said, OK, maybe some of us as an audience uh, will reflect on and what you said and how it might uh, respond to Matthias. But we are lazy, so we uh, let Matthias and uh, Katrina <laughs> do this job first <laughs> and uh, make our minds uh, as well in parallel. So um, Matthias and Katrina may May uh, you come here and uh, maybe Rebecca um, switch off your video so I do as well. Hi Matthias, this is this is where it's very unplanned, isn't it? So we're we're doing this very much on the fly here. Exactly. Yeah, but but it's uh, it's it's super interesting to see. Um, overall, I mean, I've always been a very um, open-minded and let's say open-minded proponent of using online data. I, I mean, obviously your work is very timely as Rebecca just said that's that's rather clear but it's not that um, online data hasn't been around for quite a while so, so as you say there's quite a bit of uh, data just just there just has to be analyzed the problems pro perhaps that there's so much data out there and for that reason yeah, I think you're that's certainly one of the challenges we faced in terms of you know that you, you start off a project which is often true of a qualitative research project worrying that you won't get anything and then drowning in the volume that arrives um, but I, mean, I think interesting my, my own research started off from a practice perspective not looking at strategy but actually at HR as practice and, and started off with an ethnography and I think what's interesting is that you can take that ethnographic sensitivity to an online context because there is so much about understanding or trying to work out what's just what's going on um, and who's doing what and how are they doing it so I think the there's a lot of common sensibilities across the sort of strategizing as practice um, uh, sort of community and moving that online I think it's a really good sort of fundamental tool set that you've all got Absolutely. And I think, especially for SAP, there are some very immediate use cases. I mean, you just talked about open strategy. Um, there have been papers out on wikis and blogs, as I said. I think this is something that you could easily, um, what, what do you call those techniques? Tracking and trawling? I think <laughs> these are wonderful targets for tracking and trawling. <laughs> I think that's... Um, that's that's very useful. But at the same time, I was wondering um, about uh, about the ethical issues, and I totally agree that, that that they are serious, right? They are they're absolutely serious, and we should certainly care or think more about those issues. But if we think about them, wouldn't it mean that um, the data available to us for um, let's say usable analysis, I mean for publication later on, and so on? might be smaller than we actually think. I mean, you use the, the notion of an informed consent. Um, I think, I mean, there's lots of data out there which is publicly available, but not really available for research purposes. Um, so you may be able to read it. Perhaps you may also uh, use it for analysis, but you may, you may not use it for publishing your own work later on. Um, it, it's certainly been, 
Yeah, it's certainly been a challenge for us. And I think it's different as well. And Rebecca sort of alluded to this. It's, it's, it's different for different forms of data, um, different platforms. And also, particularly, we've struggled more with um, use of visual data and imagery um, and uh, working out how to um, incorporate that later on in publications than we have necessarily with text. But I think sometimes it's about following threads and tracing through different online media. So, um, for example, it, with Twitter, we haven't, I don't think, Rebecca will correct me later, uh, in any of our publications used Twitter as data. We've used it as a way of tracing through and looking at what's happening online and where the conversations are taking place. So um, it, it really depends how you position yourself with regard to the different sort of platforms, et cetera. And we, we have always avoided Facebook because that is a particularly tricky um, online space to negotiate. And, and things are changing all, all the time. When we first started in one particularly memorable instance at a different, in, when I was at a different institution, I was just told we didn't need ethical approval because we didn't have any research participants. Um, and I think now the, the debate is getting much more advanced and sophisticated. Absolutely. Yeah, as we as we reflect on these issues, we certainly become more careful about them as well. So that makes, that makes a lot of sense. And just reflecting on the current overall circumstances, um, the, the pandemic conditions, obviously many PhD scholars, especially PhD scholars, are struggling quite heavily. As I said, um, I wouldn't say that ethnographic fieldwork is the gold standard in uh, the SAP community, but certainly a dominant way of conducting uh, research on strategy making, uh, which is principally not possible anymore, at least at least for now. Um, what what would you recommend people to do now, uh, perhaps based on on the the methods, the approaches that you have developed? I think this offers an, another tool. I don't necessarily think it's the answer because we didn't set out <laughs> with this context in mind. And obviously, you know, we, a year ago, I don't think I'd heard of Zoom, um, you know, and at least there are ways now of, of sort of, as you've said in your presentation of running, you know, workshops, seminars, almost replicating some aspects of a sort of, you know, face-to-face -face working environment online. And I'm sure those, um, pose sort of different challenges for PhD students in terms of accessing them um, because you can't sort of hover outside and around a Zoom room the same way you can ethnographically in a building. Um, but, but I think it um, looking online is, is a useful way of scoping and understanding what debates are going on um, in that space in relation to a particular field and you can follow things like for example organizational Twitter accounts and even if they are not data that you're going to use they can give you one reading of what is the sort of what are the key issues that that organization is thinking about or responding to um, or, or perhaps going to be looking at in the future um, and they can help um, you know even act as just sort of prompts for interview questions and the like. So I think there's a lot of scope to use these sorts of tools, you know, as part of the qualitative research, a sort of arsenal, if you like, you know, to have something else in your pocket to, to look at. Um, I agree, it's incredibly challenging time um, for PhD students. But I also think it's when I think back to my own ethnographic research, when I was a PhD student, I think I had some of the same anxieties. I was always concerned as an ethnographer that I wasn't in the right place, that I was missing something that was happening just around the corner or um, just over there. And, 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 you know, in some sense, being online allows you to sort of have a sense of being in more than one place at once or being able to look across a broader sense. Um, analytically, it gives you a different set of challenges, of course. Most likely. But what if what if um, Twitter data or data in forums such as Reddit would be the primary data source? I mean, think about 
uh, think about the recent um, uh, GameStop, uh, GameStop uh, stock options uh, yeah. movements where people on a Reddit forum just went crazy and, <laughs> and uh, you know, used the very same techniques as, as the hedge funds um, in order to, yeah, damage them, basically. I mean, by, this by itself is an interesting, I think, an interesting case of um, perhaps something like emergent strategy making in which um, a random group of people, I mean, not really random, they, they, they had been uh, members of that forum uh, before as well, but all of a the sudden they kind of, you know, Move together to a, to a, to a kind of cohesive group that um, that exhorted each other not to not to sell sell their stocks in order to uh, keep the price high. Um, wouldn't that I mean? Wouldn't that be an interesting uh, data source? I mean, using using this forum as a primary data source and and making an interesting case around uh, those types of dynamics, which wouldn't really be part of you know other types of data collection. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and in the book, we, we um, in fact, and also we put them on our blog. So I've, I've already tweeted a link to it, but we um, uh, include a whole list of studies that have already done this sort of thing. So people that have looked at, um, you know, places like TripAdvisor or Reddit and those sorts of sources and, and unpick ethically what they say they did. Um, I've not used Reddit directly myself, but I know that it is and has been used as a source um, for different publications. Um, but I think from our perspective, it would be also how that is discussed. So it's not just what's happening on the forum. And we particularly saw this with the GameStop, right? That, that it was how it was reported in the news, the whole, you know, David versus Goliath narrative that emerged around that. And the the different reactions to people um, either gaining or losing out of it and how they were perceived as good guys or bad guys or whatever the, con the sort of broader discursive constructions were, I suppose, because we tend to come at it more from an identity perspective than a sort of practice perspective now. That, that would be the sorts of things that would be interesting to me. But I think you could also get to unpicking some of the different practice aspects from working through that data without necessarily treating it as textual data in the way that we might do an interview transcript or something just to look at the moves and the sort of way that um, different alliances were built for example and different strategies were formed as you say you know pretty much on the fly in a really short space of time I think it would be a really interesting project to get to do actually absolutely absolutely good thank you very much Thanks for inviting us it's been End a of, pleasure it's yeah been great thank you so much for inviting us thank you thank oh, you thank too you so